Kia ora and welcome to another Aotearoa Rugby Pod. I'm Ross Carl and as ever joined by Bryn Hall down in Christchurch and James Parsons in uh, the beautiful sunny North Shore. How are you boys? <laughs> Very well mate. Very well. Always I'm happy on the you, shore. Man. 20 degrees down here in Christchurch, so uh, very nice and warm. Nice, but better than living with Sean Stevenson, eh? Oh, look, mate, it's hard enough living in with him one day and then get a break from him going to training, so I uh, couldn't imagine doing three to four weeks or however long we have in lockdown, so nah, but live with my lovely partner, much better. Nice, nice, eh? Well, look, guys, we've got reason to celebrate today because we've found out that obviously the rugby championship will be going ahead. Um, well, not necessarily as planned, but definitely going ahead. Perth uh, bled as low three, not this weekend, but the following weekend. And then we've got double headers back to back to back mm. to back to get the rugby championship oh. done. Two versus Argentina, two versus South Africa. Jippa, you're fired up. Oh, I'm fired <laughs> up, mate. Uh, whenever, the, whenever there's that much footy uh, coming our way, it's exciting. Um, but yeah, look, bled as low three will be played. Um, I know there's been some chat around that, but it's great to see that, that that'll... Um, play out and, and we'll get the rugby championship. And I think it's just credit to the teams behind the teams that do the work, mm. uh, trying to get these uh, things across the line, like the, the amount of manpower and hours that have gone in that I know personally from the NZR team, um, trying to get this across the uh, the line as well as there would be in Aussie and, and South Africa and RG. And to know that all four teams uh, have the ability to get to Queensland and play this rugby championship, it's, it's exciting. Bryn, from a player's perspective, Queensland better than going to South Africa, better than going to Europe as far as a Kiwi player is concerned? Yeah, look, I think if, if you're an All Blacks uh, player, it's definitely a lot easier. The The commute over there is a lot shorter. Um, it's closer to home. And um, yeah, I, I find obviously it's a, it's a lot closer to home, the main thing. And um, yeah, it's great. I think Chip has brought, a, a really, brought up a really good point around the powers that be behind the scenes and getting this job done. I know there's a lot of hate in the media at the start of the week with Australia and, and New Zealand not um, not being on the same page. But look, when you get a competition structure that's come out and awesome uh, work from the Queensland part to, to be able to come and run the rugby championship again, which is, um, you know, we want to be able to see rugby and um, with the opportunity that um, the Queensland state have given not only New Zealand, but Australia and Argentina and South African countries. Um, it gives us an opportunity to see rugby like Chipper gets to see double headers now for the next couple of weeks, oh. which is great. Chipper, <laughs> uh, I, I hate to say this, you know, but well, actually I don't really, you know, weeks ago we <laughs> talked about the fact that maybe they should have just done this in the first place. Yeah, you did. Um, and you must have had your crystal ball out when you came out with that. Um, but I just think, um, you know, if that was the option in the current circumstances that we have now, back then, then yeah, they would have been planning for that. But the world we live in is certainly not the world we live in. Uh, we're living, we lived in back uh, when we spoke a, a month or so ago. So Even uh, as I ago. said, I just want to credit the people um, that are working um, tirelessly to get these games played mm -hmm. and, and with the information that they're given at the current point of time, they make the best decisions for the, for the game and, and, and the players making sure that one, these games get played, but more importantly, they get played safely. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's take a step back though. I suppose we've got the right result here, but obviously the methods on the way haven't quite been right. The communication lines between NZR, Mark Robinson, Andy Marinos at Rugby Australia. And then we heard from uh, Dave Rennie during the week, that uh, he wasn't happy with how this had played out. Does this relationship need a lot more work and a lot more care from here on in, uh, Bryn? Oh, I think ideally, um, you'd love it to be a smooth, smooth sailing. But you know, I think like all relationships, not just like the talk about the Australian New Zealand um, relationship, but just relationships in general, you're always going to be testing. You're not always going to agree on things. So. Look, I think it just shows that both uh, both unions care and both countries care. Obviously, you've got your own um, beliefs and wanting how you want things to go. But look, I think um, the way it played out in public, you know, they probably can speak for both parties that they didn't want to come out in public like that to be seen like that. But I think the great thing about a relationship is that you can almost if you can come together and look, we have we've got a competition that's going to be based in Queensland that we've talked around and. Um, look, I think there, there will be learnings from it around um, maybe communicating a little bit better because it has been aired out a little bit in the media. So there might be a little bit more um, look around that in, in the future. But look, I think um, we've come to a conclusion around it. We've got a great competition that's in front of us. And then you know, I think from the learnings from it being aired out, I don't think we should see that again, hopefully not see that again. And um, they'll continue to keep mending that relationship in the future, hopefully.
Jeez, he's taken, ladies. I, I'm sorry to say, because that kind of talk about communication and relationship building with Becky Hot Property out there. <laughs> <laughs> I learned it from the book fellow on my, on, my, on my left, so. it's good that we're there in the end the other piece of news today obviously is that this weekend's rugby won't go ahead npc fpc it's all being a little bit delayed um bryn for you um how are you feeling about how um this is all playing out and how do you react to it oh look it's not great i think you know for us as players excuse me what we want to be out there, you know, women and men out there playing for our, for our regions and, and being able to play rugby because we are official rugby players and we want to do that. But I think at the same time, we've got a pretty good understanding around the previous past around going through COVID and going through an isolation and what's best for the country because, you know, this COVID variant um, is pretty bad considered, uh, compared to the last one we had. It's, uh, the infection rates are a lot worse. So I think we've, we're pretty clear and have a good understanding around that. Um, it's the right decision to be in lockdown but i think for us it's more so you know you want to be out there and um it's more so the isolated training and not being able to train as a group and um you've got to have a real self-driven work ethic to do it by yourself because you're not with that team um being able to do that by yourself but i think i can only speak from harbour's experience we've got a great team behind us around um, using zoom setups to keep us engaged and keep us learning and then our training staff with alex 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 king being able to keep us nice and fit is, is probably the best thing that you all can do and so I can imagine from a lot, a lot of the other unions, uh, they're going through the same situation. But, you know, we'd love to be out there and hopefully, um, you know, in the next coming weeks we can. And, um, you know, this kind of peak at the moment of COVID can um, can start going down and we can start getting into position to play some more rugby. And Jippa, from your perspective as a person who works for the <coughs> Players Association as well, I mean, you must be doing a lot of work at the moment to get around all of the talent around the country and make them feel um, safe and well and, and make them understand what's going on. Yeah, absolutely, mate. I think the one benefit I have is I experienced it last year and and know uh, what they're going through. And I I think the biggest thing, just like Bryn has sort of alluded to, is controlling the controllables. I know it's a little bit of a cliche, but uh, making the best out of the situation, you can review a little bit harder and deeper on the games that that have been played and, and potentially sharpen up on a few things. Guys that might not have been at the point they want in terms of fitness, um, they can sharpen up on that. And then also the guys that are out injured, it's potentially giving them time to come back into the squad and mm. and, and play play a part um, in some games in the latter part of the season. So out of, a, out of a negative, you can make a positive. And I think that's one thing um, sports people are great at is um, working with what's in front of them and then making a plan and then going after it and, and making sure that they're ready to pull trigger uh, once it's, um, you know, once the games are cleared and we're back out there. Let's change tack a little bit. Uh, we've got we've, we've done that to death, I think. Um, let's change tack a little bit. Uh, the Pacific Nations Cup. Uh, USA Rugby's come out and they've asked for NZR support in order to get the Pacific Nations Cup going again. Now, it was a pretty exciting competition back in its day when it was being run, and then it kind of slowly died away. I don't even remember why it died. Um, is that the way forward for Pacific Asia, America's rugby development, Bryn, bringing back the Pacific Nations Cup? Well, I, I think so, because I think, um, you know, there's probably, the, especially the Pacific Island nations, they love having those test matches and being able to play um, regular games. Um, and so I remember back in the day, New Zealand Māori were also a part of that. And um, even early in those days, you know, USA and um, England A were a part of those kind of um, competitions back in back in the early days. But um, I think it's really important. I think the more test matches that, um, you know, the likes of Tonga and some, if you look at probably the examples of them playing the All Blacks, you know, they need to be able to have those regular test matches. And I guess the probably the challenges, though, is that I, talk, I saw in some in the media with the Americans, um, is that, you know, they want their best players to be able to play, though. So, you know, that needs to be in a window when their clubs that can release them. So if they are going to be put into a competition, you want their best players playing. So I think it's no different from probably the struggles that the, South, the Samoans and the, um, the Tongans and even the Fijians to a certain extent have had problems in the past getting their players to be able to release, to get released to play in meaningful test matches. So... I think, you know, co- collaboratively with all the countries aligned, um, if they can get a plan in a place where it's set in a, in a timetable to suit everybody, to have the best players possible, because then I think it, it brings the level of rugby up and the bit of competition and then it actually means like their, their test matches that can help them develop them going forward when they do play the, the Tier 1 Nations later on, probably in the, in the following years. Well, maybe there's a way of thinking about this differently. You know, we're thinking about it being something that's NZR-led. If all of the players, the top players from Tonga, Samoa, they're all up north. Maybe this should run during the November test window or during the Six Nations Championship. Uh, 
Oh, for me, I look, I look at it totally differently. I, I think it's one step at a time. Uh, I, I think it was a great tournament and, and it warrants, um, you know, looking at bringing it back and, and getting more tests for everyone is what what we want to see. We want to grow the game so that it is, you know, worldwide and, and there, there's that, you know, drive and connection to, to the game of rugby in each part of the world. But I think for NZR, um, you know, it's been put on them, I, I think they're already a real big focus on um, Moana Pacifica and, and Fiji Jura. And the reason I think those teams are so crucial is that it can, in time, provide a pathway for talent um, out of out of Tonga, Samoa and Fiji um, to these teams that, you know, they'll be wanting to represent, you know, just like I grew up really wanting to play for the Blues. There's a there's a blue, uh, there's a Harbour Academy, then there's Harbour, then there's a Blues Academy, and there's a genuine pathway to get to that if 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 you want that, um, and and if these teams can be successful in Super Rugby, you know there can be a, a pathway back in Tonga and Samoa and Fiji with academy setups, junior teams having the ability to potentially play in the under twenties um, here. So I, I think it's almost that long focus. Um, you know, if, I hate to bring it back to league, but the way Phil Gould sort of changed the philosophy of, of really putting time into the young guys at Penrith, mm-hmm. and now you're really getting to see that the time they've spent together and the pathway that's been created for them, they're, they're starting to see the the success of that. And um, I, I'm not saying not to have these tests or this tournament, but it's just that one step at a time and, and really focusing in on what's key for them. And they've made a real commitment, a financial commitment, but also a backing um, as an NZR have to, to get these teams up and running, but also in time, those teams themselves are, are going to want to create that that pathway for talent coming out of those regions. So are you saying that the Pacific Nations Cup isn't necessarily something that the Southern Hemisphere should be looking after? No, no, it's not that. I just think there's only so much you can do. Like, like, And, and then if you spread yourself too thin, you're not going to be able to nail it. Like, It's just like living your own life, you know, when you're trying to spread yourself too thin, you, you're doing, you know, half a job on everything rather than and nailing that. That's just my philosophy on things is if you, if you're clear on the two or three or four things you want to do, and then just go for it. And and I think NZR have um, been awesome in the support they've shown for Moana Pacifica and, and Fiji Dura. And, and that's what I think, I think in time, those pathways and, and keeping talent focused on playing for these teams and those areas eventually got the test teams and where to from there they they might be some of the best tier one teams in, in years to come and this is a short focus thing if we can get this tournament up and running to make the game worldwide i'm all for but putting it all on nzr i just think it's a little bit unfair because they're, they're really rolling their sleeves up on their own game at the moment and trying to create these pathways and opportunities for others mm. yeah i think it could come yeah. under a standby window right well, I think, well, not, not necessarily. I think, you know, I think the powers that be you're talking around, they can, they can influence in that sense. But I think, you know, if you're talking around American rugby, I think it's first and foremost, you know, their, their job to be able to go through the viable options to be able to try and make it work. So, you know, you talk around having a competition that we've talked about in the past when you had, you know, the Zealand Māori, um, the Pacific Islander Nations and America in and around that. So I think um, you can have like influence that can be able to whether it be Sansa, you talked around New Zealand rugby, but I think, you know, for them, I think it's important for them to be able to, to go and do it on their own, to be able to um, to bring it um, to the competition that they want. So yeah, I think it's important to have um, support around that, but I think it's some, you know, if they want their job, their, their, their game to grow, you know, obviously they've got the MLR that's been there, that they've just put it, they've brought in. But I think you talk around, we've talked around this is different, like the Trans-Tasman, and we had talked about being real competitive and having a great product. I think if they do want that competition, you've got to be able to have it as a, as a competitive product. So coming back to my point around, if they do, let's say hypothetically, they get it over the line and they have the competition be able to bring um, different countries in for test matches, then your to your solution around having it in the November series where predominantly um, most of the um, Pacific Island nation players are playing in Europe and then the Americans do play in there or in, in, with the MLR, have a competition that it's, it's for everybody and then it's a competitive um, competition. And so then viewers can actually start to view in. Cause I think you know, the last thing you want is not having the best players for their country. If there is a competition that does come out, 
and um, you know get, get the product doesn't end up end up being great a great viewing. Yeah, I think we most all know. Sorry, I, I think we all know that if we can get the the Eagles humming and a successful team like that's great for the game of rugby. So I think everyone in the world wants that to see the USA Eagles going well. We know when you know look at the growth in Japan and how much you know love for the game of rugby that's brought. Uh, you know some of their big victories at Test match level, not only at Test match level but filtering down into their club comp. Like watching the top fourteen. Um, you know, it is a great competition to watch. And then, you know, we all know um, at length that we want the Pacific Island teams to, you know, have more opportunity to play. So in theory, this competition is great, but it, it's not necessarily uh, just a blueprint. Like there might be something better that we can do um, that can that can include them rather than sort of just putting them off to the side in their own competition, if that makes sense. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, absolutely. Now let's talk some rugby, shall we? Shall we? <laughs> yeah. <please. Come> <laughs> uh, there was some rugby on the weekend. Uh, Springbok versus Los Pumas. Um, South Africa did it pretty easily across both of these test matches. Uh, what do you guys make of Argentina? Obviously, they made some big strides last year with the win over South Africa. Are we seeing now the repercussions of not having the Juarez? Oh, I don't think so. Like, I think if you saw early on in the game, they made some good defensive plays that got turnovers and then went to the corner. But it's maybe just that time together and and um, having a having a good lead in. Because if you watch that seventy fifth minute to the eighty fifth, like that's that's the Argentinian team that we know and love. You know, they they chance around with offloads. They're still one of the best sides in the world from unstructured play. But a lot of the time on the weekend when they got in behind the South African D, the Springboks are just so good over the ball. And if there's a separation between the ball carrier and the cleaner, you know, even Cheslin Colby got over for one. You know, that's a, he's, he's not the biggest frame, but he got over and got a turnover, I think, in the 49th minute after some good play from, from the RG side. So I think they've still got their blueprint of what to play, but they just struggled... I suppose with the set piece more than anything um, and to get their game going, and and then obviously the pressure from the penalties. We spoke about it from the All Blacks' point of view with the Wallabies in their last twenty from the, from the first test. Uh, it, it just mounts because although they held on in that first half, they had to make a hell of a lot of tackles. I think it was thirteen to five penalties, so they're constantly on D, um, and and they're passionate and they'll keep turning up. There's no question of that, but eventually. Um, you know, the, the energy tank gets sapped um, when you're on D for that long. So I don't think it's drastic. I, I think it's almost, you, we have to give credit to the way um, the Springboks are playing. Like they've got a blueprint of the way they want to play and they, they just execute it really well. And it doesn't matter at what 23 they put out there at the moment. They've got such good depth, you know, like they, they've got guys getting opportunities each week. And, you know, you, I can't remember the last time I saw Malcolm Mark start. And I thought he was player of the day. He was exceptional. And, and I don't want to flip the Argentinian question onto the Springboks, but, you know, a lot of what um, they tried to do was was nullified by the Springboks and their defensive setup and their ability in and around that, that breakdown. And then their patience on attack, they're, they're one of the best. If they don't get any go forward, they'll put it on the boot. And a lot of this talk about their kicking game, a lot of their kicks are attacking kicks. So they're, they're genuinely trying to get the ball back and playing a style that, you know, is acceptable from where I see. That's mm. it. So you, you don't think they're boring, Bryn? Uh, Nick Mallett's come out and defended that he doesn't care if they're boring or not. And he's just like, well, if it wins footy games, what does it matter? Well, I think I think that's it. And I think um, he brought up some pretty good points around it because I think um, if you look back in probably that 2016-2017 when we won that game in Albany with that, that record scoreline, um, the All Blacks had probably had probably changed the game more so around the skill set of our big boys and been able to run with the ball on hand. And so I think there was a shift around, if you look around when the South Africans won that World Cup in, in 2007, they had that predominantly that kicking game. Um, then 2011 came around, it was pretty, a little bit similar, but then I think 2015, the All Blacks really came along and just the attacking brand of rugby that they were playing, the rest of the world tried to catch up and play with them. And so 
Mel had brought up some really good points around that is that they took the learnings from that that big loss in 2017. There's, probably, there's a lot of the similar guys that are playing them in the test match that they are now. Um, but they've just changed their style. If you talk around um, their defense, their defense, Stripper brought up a really good point. They were 93% on the weekend. You know, that's that's world that's world class defense defense with anything above um, you know ninety percent is considered you know the best defense in the world. So they've got an identity that they're, that, they're, that they're playing with, and you know it's it's not pretty. You know we've talked about a lot on this podcast during that um, that line series around you know we want them to play an attacking brand of rugby, but they do play they do play rugby when they get into that kind of uh, when they win that field battle and they start to play inside the twenty two or the attacking zone. That's when you are seeing them playing their, their brand of footy. You know, for Larue when he gave that draw and pass to Mopipi, it was a great um, high face counter they played. So they've got a really clear plan around the contestables game and not playing um, any footy in their half. And I think the one thing the All Blacks probably need to address when they do play them is that off the contestable kicks, their efficiency of their breakdown and being able to go through cleaning past the ball or jackals on the ball, uh, whether it be uh, Colby or sometimes it's even kits off. He was the one that got a turnover off that. So, and one thing that I, I noticed in this this test match as well around their, their kick chase is the the organisation around where they need to be off their kick chase. Um, you can see their halfback marshalling. Even the forwards have a real good idea of where they're supposed to be. So, they've got their blocker. They've got a guy standing there like a statue. But then they're also working around um, where they need to be off their kick chase. So, if they do get it right, um, their, their defensive line set up, and so. Um, the Argentinians tried to play, but then they tried to obviously go back into the kicking game. They set up the long ruck similar to what the um, Argentinians did. But for me, they're winning test matches. You know, they've won, they've lost the first test match against the Lions, but you know they're winning convincingly against playing the style. So it's going to be interesting to see how if the All Blacks do make the adjustments that um, yeah, you know, probably the, the Lions haven't got them right. The Argentinians haven't, haven't got them right in the last two test matches. And you know, why would they want to change when they're winning test matches like the way they are? But- but I think I think they they played like if you look at them early yep. they kicked to the corner when they had a penalty, they kicked multiple yep. times and then due to the discipline issues with RG is they 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 needed some reward for the work they were doing because they couldn't get that flow of play because it was just getting killed by you know ill discipline so they they went with a mindset to play and then you saw straight after half time Mpimpi's um, try. It's a special line out. So it's a bunter line out inside ball to Colby, gets in behind. Mm-hmm. And then, yep, they go to their direct carries. But Reiner is, because he gets out and has a look, he creates space for others. And if it's not on, he's, he's got the ability to run himself. And you saw in that play, he ran himself, got right in behind, nearly scored. And then they came back from great work off the ball from, from LaRue. He came from the blind side to make the extra number on the open side and, and clears up the space. So... I think it can it can just be a little bit of a myth at times. If you actually watch the they they they've got the ability to play both styles, and I mentioned that last week with the way they they played that first test and and then the personnel changes. They've they've got the ability to go to their defensive kicking game, but they've they've also got the ability to play. And with the maul and set piece they've got going at the moment, I think they're actually looking to play a hell of a lot more. And the only reason the kick stats were so high this week, I believe, is because they had advantage. And when they had advantage, they they chanced their arm with little kicks in behind or chip and chases or cross-field kicks. And it adds up. And if you just look at it statistically, it doesn't give the full picture of the flow of the game. Um, and, and, and they took their points via threes after a good you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes of trying to break down the RGD, but because of that ill-discipline, mm-hmm. they, th- they thought, look, we've got to chip away with some points here because we're doing a lot of work for no reward. Yeah. A few guys who you like out of these teams, obviously maybe Lucanio Arm is a guy over the last couple of years who's just become a rock of the South African side. Yeah, yeah he has, I think. He, he was fantastic in that, um, in that British National Lions series, I think more so around his defensive reads and being able to put line speed pressure under, under teams, I think, with... The way the, the the South Africans' defense is with them playing so high with Colby and Mopepe staying so high, it gives real confidence for your midfielders to be able to make good decisions. And and Arm did that; he's been doing that consistently. But I think I've actually really enjoyed Delande De, De as well. I think um, he brings a real good go forward off the off their off their especially their lineup more. So Jeff talked around that they had a lot of advantages and they played a lot through him um, with playing in the twelve, him carrying, or if they did go at the back, they played a Pollard and they tried to get with with that. But 
And I've really, you talk around having really good midfielders and being able to get that um, continuity together. You know, they've played a British and Irish Lions series, been been really, um, been really good and strong. And then um, they've had obviously that test match against Argentina on the weekend that um, was was good as well. So I think it's going to be a great challenge if you look at the All Blacks moving forward for David Harvilli, um moving forward because I think. Um, it's physicality and, and they're bigger men in that, in that kind of transition area. And I think um, it'd be a good test for David now. If, if, if Rico is at sense or ALB playing against two guys that are um, that are real dominant uh, ball carriers, real strong, but then at the same time make really good defensive reads as well. So, um, yeah, they're sitting really well and um, it's going to be a good, good battle for our boys when we do hopefully get the opportunity to play them. The thing I like about Arm is, <clears throat> excuse me, is he has the ability to rush up defensively. And I think he's one of the biggest reasons why South Africa is so successful in their defensive system. Um, and we all know that 13, I believe, is the hardest probably position on the field to defend because you've got to connect with the guys that are close on your inside, but also you've got wingers that sometimes have to be 50-50 covering that backfield and that pendulum play. Um, but what Arne does so well is he gets up, he almost says, if you want to throw an intercept, you're going to have to do it over me, which will give me time to recover which he does so mm. well, but also when he gets up there and their numbers down, he has the ability to slide as well if they do get on the inside and his work rate to cover that that outside channel once the ball's gone there is, is outstanding. And I think you saw that none other than, I think it was in the 79th minute, he got back and, uh, you know, intercepted that ball through, uh, I think the RG sort of just bobbled it and he got it, but he didn't give up on the play. And, and that's the biggest thing that he's doing so well defensively. He never gives up on the play. He works extremely hard to split with the Lande, so they've got both sides of the field, and they're looking after and marshalling the troops inside them. So um, there's a lot of stuff he does that doesn't involve him actually doing an action that forces the opposition to do something and play into their hands and go back into their big boys. Uh, a word on the halfbacks. They've got Fatu. Uh, not Fatu because he was a cricketer. <laughs> um, they've got Fat, <laughs> and they've also got Corbus Reinach. They've got some real depth there with outstanding halfbacks. Reinach's been a revelation up north recently. You know, he's got the speed of his dad, who was South Africa two hundred meters champion. He is. He is a really good player that we haven't seen a lot of in the southern hemisphere because he's he's played his trade up north bit. Well, yeah, you talk around talk around opportunities, and you know you talk around Fafta Clerk and um, how pivotal he was in that in that line series, especially those first two test matches. And we talked around his kicking game and his different variety of kicks are, are massive, are massive for that group. And um, look, when he does come back from from injury, no doubt he'll be at a focal point around around um, their their team. But you know, Kerbis Ryan, like you know, I've played against him and uh, when I was younger, and you know, for someone that. Um, it's so quick and off the mark, you know, there was a, a phase of play where he, they had a scrum, uh, they had a dominant scrum set Africa and he ends up picking up the ball and ends up gassing in, around the six, but his top end speed is so quick and he got around and then uh, made a, a long line break, um, which ended up being a, a, knock, um, a mistake. But, you know, when you can have that kind of explosiveness, and especially around midfield scrums or scrums and opportunities around that, it's great to have as a halfback in them. Dripper talked about it earlier as well when they scored for um, my Pepe's try. His ability to be able to snipe and be able to change that point of attack straight away. We talked around Tate McDermott in that in that test match against the All Blacks, being able to um, being able to play on top of teams at speed and then being able to hold that hard defense up and be able to make them make decisions. And Reinick does a really good job around that. So I think it depends what try they do want to go. Do they want if because if you're going to go a kicking game, they are probably fuff the clerk. And that pressure game is probably just a little bit more better around his kicking game. Reinick's done a great job and still um, kicks very well, but I think Fuff the Clerk is probably the best in the world um, at that kind of at that kind of um, game plan. And then Kobus Reinick, if they want to have a running game, that we've talked about with Alton Yanchis in that with him in there last week, um, and even then this week his running game. Um, he's a guy that you can start. So it just depends what kind of style they they do want to go. And even if you do bring Reinick off the bench, uh, we've talked around that twenty-one impact role and been able to come on late in games, uh, he can play that role as well, whereas Fluff the Clerk can do it, but I think he'd probably be a better starter um, going forward. Bruno, I know that you used to get our locks to try and charge you down. You'd practice your box kick about three million times at training. <laughs> can you? I haven't seen a charge down in years. Um, I think it was Labanini got through and charged down Boop. twice Boop. on, on yeah. Rhino. So is, is that... Is that what you're probably getting at there around that that kicking game? Is is I suppose that's his biggest work on area if he does want to own that nine jersey. I think so. I think if you're talking around 
box kicks and contestable kicks, then then yeah, I think the execution of not of not getting charged down is um, is probably at, at, at the forefront. But you know, Kobus Reinick's probably done. He's been in the Northern Hemisphere and has probably has a pretty good idea around what it looks like. But just it's credit to Labanini and his timing around it. You know, some locks are really great at. I mean, I look at uh, Mitchell Dunshe and, and our team. He just got a real knack around being able to charge down, charge that ball. So I think that'll be an easy fix with the with the length of ruck um, and probably his direction of if he wants to go a little bit more, he'll change around that. But I think. What Fuff the Clerk does really well, not just contestable games, but it's his attacking kicks. He's got a real good ability to be able to see the space behind. So if you're talking around the pendulum, he's got a really good understanding of where they are. And it's not just uh, contestable kicks. It's been able to put into a corner a long kick and then been able to bounce it out. And then you can gain, gain momentum and being able to put them in um, an attacking or their attacking zone in the defensive team's side. So I think Fuff the Clerk is just a little bit better around that and seeing that field space um, and probably doing it at test level. Not to say that Cobus Reiner can't do it, but Fafta Klerk has been proving it um, at a high level for a long time, been able to do, been able to implement that game plan. Rolling malls, Chip. Hookers love rolling malls, you know, for another try of the weekend, you know, just getting on the back and taking that try. Um, the South African rolling mall and their rolling mall defence looks very good. Yeah, I mean, I think Malcolm Marks would take you on at that. He was putting a bit of weight through there, no doubt, at the back of that mall. Um, but if we use that as a great example of, of why they're so good on attack is one, they they normally win the ball middle back, which is, mm. you know, half the battle. And if they can do that, they can almost start heading towards the goalposts in a sense. And, and that's what they did because all that weight of, um, you know, all the pressure coming from the RG forwards is almost coming from the side and, and pushing them towards that corner and, and what the Springboks did so well on Marx's tries, they utilized that pressure from them to head towards the post. And then, then if you watch in the replay, two or three RG players bail out of that position and try to come back in and from the back and, and stop it. And the Springboks just shared back to where, they, where they'd come from. So they utilized their pressure again to help them get to their, their I suppose, their momentum. And then once they had left that spot. There was almost no one in front of them, and, and it's an easy try. Yeah. But they're patient. They win the ball in great areas. And then once they set, they work together almost like a scrum. They work together as eight. You know, they've all got a role yeah. to play, and they're all prepared to play that role. And they feel it. They're, they're so good at feeling that where that pressure's coming from to use that to their advantage rather than fight against it. Mm. I think just on that as well, um, Chip, because I think um... – Winning that, correct me if I'm wrong, but winning that ball at the at the at the middle or back in that kind of area. If you're going into the 15 and you're going sharing towards the back and going in towards the goal line, sorry to the goal post, and you send backs going down the the blind side or you're kind of manipulating that way, it's going to hold off a couple of guys for that split moment, and that's all you might need to be able to go forward and to keep that rolling ball going forward. Because I think you know if you want it at the front, um, it's a little bit easier. You can get the forwards to go in um, towards the sideline and be able to hit that, but I know for a back, if you want to have the attacking line, a line-out drive, if you can win it at the back, it opens up so much opportunity to be able to attack off that with the backs. But then at the same time, you can hold off defenders, whether it be a prop holding off. If you send a couple of guys down the blind side, it holds them off, and then you can keep that rolling more going. So do, just on that, do you think the um, Argentinians should have just, you know, um, had middle back sort of and, and give the South Africans the front ball? Yeah, look, they gave the Springboks um, the front ball early and, and they they hooked in and dealt to it towards the sideline. And, and that's what you're getting mm -hmm. at. Defensively, when you win the ball at the front, it's so easy to come from from an angle that hit, pushes the attacking side back into that um, you know transition channel close to going out. Um, that's why mm -hmm. it's not the best um, ball to play off. But if you can share and utilise that, sometimes you can go around the corner that way. But because the, there's such big bodies, the RGs, they, they, they killed that. So the Springboks adjusted and, and went to that middle back ball. Uh, the one thing about the back ball, if you're good at sacking, it's probably best to sack it because you're not going to be able to get the numbers around and come from the angle you want because all, all your numbers are sort of stacked to that front middle because you're trying to defend the lineup first and foremost. So if, that, if, mm. if the RGs had the ability to sack, uh, potentially pulling it down straight away and stopping it dead, I, I think you can remember Kieran Reid did it extremely well in the in the pool game against the Springboks in 2019. He pretty much just killed it dead, and it forces them to play off static ball or kick off static mm. ball. So they're not kicking on their terms. So a, a sack play would would work around that middle back 
um, it, it's a little bit defeatist in the sense that you're not getting up to challenge the ball, but they're pretty mm. effective. Like Marks was hitting his line out jumpers crisp, um, and, and yeah. they had it they had it running. So I think um, those that, that's a tactic I, I would look at um, taking them to um, defensively mm. to stop it. And then you know even the Springboks when they go defensively, um, they'll they'll use the sideline as their friend. If um, you know. RG win up front middle, they'll they'll look to put them through and, and take them to the sideline. But the problem is, is because they're so good defensively getting up in the air and they cause the RGs a bit of, bit of trouble at line-out time, it forced Argentina to go to the front. Even when they didn't maul, they're, they're off the top ball. Their halfback was under so much pressure from Lou Di, Di Diego uh, coming through and looking for him. And that's Probably the biggest emphasis of the Springboks is they're just relentless on every play at the moment, and they, they those little small wins just mount up over and over again, especially in that lineout play, and can start playing mentally on a side, and and it just didn't allow the Argies to get into the game when they operate at both scrum and lineout at seventy five percent. I can imagine, yeah. I can imagine that um, if you talk around, because obviously Mallet came out and talked around the set piece, and that they've got a better set piece than the All Blacks. I can imagine that's an area that they're going to go at. You know, you look at, you talked around the efficiency of Mark Strip. His first 14 lineouts were 14 out of 14. You know, so if you can yeah. have that kind of efficiency as a as a hooker, um, and if you talk around the lineout drive and even the variation that they do have, um, you know, you talk around going inside to Colby in, early in that second half. But I think if you're if you're if you're a South African team, you look at probably the Fijians when the Fijians were able to penetrate through the through the line out more with the All Blacks early in that, in that series. I think it's um, it's going to be a good battle because I think Mallet came out and said, yeah, they've got a better set piece than, than the All Blacks. Um, you know, they've got a great scrum. They've got a lot of penalties in that British and Irish line series. And even on the weekend as well, they had 100% eight from eight. So um, if it's one area that the All Blacks are probably going to be looking at and really looking forward to, to seeing how they um, test themselves, I think it's probably the set from pack who are probably um, in, in a rich train of form in both scrum and line out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's three areas that um, will be key for the All Blacks to look at. It's obviously set pieces one um, and, and that more defence, but also um, cleaning your own breakdowns, not allowing those ins. We saw Fiji get um, a few turnovers at the breakdown and then the All Blacks made that adjustment. So I think that area will be crucial. And then it's who you select in the back three comes into it because so many times from the errors that were made from not taking the high ball, put the spring box in such prime position to attack, mm. but also creates that ill discipline and they got advantage plays and, and ended up taking the three. So those three points um, are, are key for the, the All Blacks to focus on. But also I think there's a couple of opportunities out there as well. Switching back down mm. blind a few times, RG put a kick in behind when the winger was up and um, I think LaRue was trying to free himself to the open. Um, and there, there's that little sort of kick space there if, if um, you know, we're sharp enough. Um, and then also, um, I, I think the biggest thing is defensively, their phase play shape is, um, you know, pretty clear. Like when they run direct, they almost grab the forward by the, by the jersey and go with them. And then when they look to play out the back as forwards, they spread that pod. Um, so I think it, it enables the All Blacks to bring some real heat defensively, line speed, and and almost do what the the Springboks been doing to other teams and put their skill sets under pressure um, a lot more through through that area because it, it, there are some areas of their phase play that can be predictable, which which gives you the ability to get off the line and, and go for it. But on the flip side, the Springboks could start working at their interplay between their forwards and spreading that um, attacking pod i suppose so that they can mm. play some tips or some inside balls as well as that release ball to pollard and and Yanchus. yeah i think also i think sorry ross i think also the the decision making around the all blacks but there you talk around we've really got, got a great skill set around our, our tip runners but i think with with how efficient they are around their breakdown and how quick they get on the ball i think the decision making around i look at the argentinians and early especially early on they didn't play a lot of their a lot of their tips there wasn't a lot of variety around their tip play but i think at the same time because the the, the south africans are so strong in, in the break and the tackle area i think the decision making around you know being able to have um great footwork into contact the two cleaners be able to get that quick ball but then at the same time being able to manipulate and, and make the right decisions with the tip ball and getting out the back to richie if they selected at 10. yeah oh that's massive because you saw every time argy's got in behind defensively they got turned over 
through a breakdown. Yeah. And it's because numbers 1 to 15, 1 to 23 in the spring box at the moment are great over the ball. But more importantly, yeah. it's the tackler that's doing the work. They wrap the legs. They're not going in for the big hits or anything. They get round those legs, get the um, attacking player to ground, which gives the Springboks time to access that ball before that disconnect of the cleaners. And mm -hmm. you're right, if you give that tip away and someone gets a half break, which is what you're looking for, but if you get yeah. checked as the guy giving the tip and you can't clean that ruck, well, it's all too easy for them. Let's change tack again. Let's head back home. Um, I think we got right to the bottom of what the box doing there, boys. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty epic analysis. You're not going to get there anywhere else. Um, over the last few weeks, uh, the breakdown on a Monday night on Sky Sport has been doing New Zealand's greatest 15, the search for the greatest All Black team of all time, which was happening in the lead up to a few events coming up, which are, are no longer happening in New Zealand. Uh, now, last week we saw Michael Jones, Richie McCaw, and Zinzan Brook become the greatest loose forward combination as voted by the New Zealand public and a bunch of Sky Sport analysts. Now, let's go to that first. And then also, well, Aaron Smith and Dan Carter um, cutting into the team this week as the halves. So, Brent, let's start with you. Those five names, they seem like a lay down is there for you. They should definitely be in that all time team. Well, I think so. I think um, Kieran Reid is his 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 hard, his hard done by. <laughs> Jeez, he was uh, he was wasn't a bad number eight playing around, but um, yeah, I think no. Look, Zin, I think Zinzan Brooks is a good one. I think um, you know, like he revolution. If you talk about revolutionising the game, and we talked around the Colsey and how he's changed the hooker's game, you know, he was a guy that you know was probably before his time. You look, we talk around number eight's been able to be play like backs, so like Hoskins Satuta, who can kick in behind off the number eight's feet. You know, Zinzan Brooks can do drop goals as well, so. I think he was a bit before his time and um, it's probably warranted of a selection, but obviously Kieran Reid was the guy that you could probably arguably say that. But I think at number nine, um, it's pretty hard to to go through um, Aaron Smith. And, you know, he's the first centurion halfback to be able to play 100 games for the All Blacks. And you're talking about revolutionising the game, especially in New Zealand. Um, he's done that. But, you know, if you look at another guy, Justin Marshall, who was before Aaron Smith, was the most capped All Black with 81, 81, 80 or test matches and was a hell of a competitor and um, you know he's probably one guy that um, you could possibly put on that number nine list but I think at number 10 um, Dan Carter's probably um, I don't think you're beating him with anybody even though he like the likes of Grant Fox and Andrew Murdens to name a few but look Dan Carter just um, was was good for such a long period of time and um, his record speaks for itself is the amount of test matches the amount of points most points in, in test rugby so uh, it's hard to go by him um, is, is number 10, the best number 10 through, through this country. Well, I like, Bryn, that you uh, mentioned Marshy there. You know, that's good when a commentator gets a compliment like that, you know. You're going to get some good comments from him. I, I see what you're doing there. I see what angle you're going with there. Um, you said Kieran Reid's hard, hard done by. Well, Jerome Kino, Jerry Collins, and, and Michael Jones, I mean... It's a hard one to pick, no doubt, but yeah. um, all three of them would make most teams. But I think Michael Jones probably uh, takes it just for, you know, his his versatility and ability to, to do um, some unthinkable things and, and amazing skill set on the field. But uh, those those two big bruises and, and Kaino and um, Collins, it, it's amazing that you, you think they're going to miss out on the ultimate um, greatest 15. Um, and I think yeah. Richie picks himself. Um, and I think the other two guys pick themselves as well. And, and um, Aaron Smith and Dan Carter. Dan Carter's the complete player, isn't he? Like You spoke about Foxy and Mertz and, and their ability to kick goals and, and put the uh, team in the right position of the field were second to none. But uh, Dan brought that third string and that running game and, and attacking, kicking yeah. game and and the other aspects as well. He could kick goals and he could, he could um, find space in the backfield as well. So... As, as the movie, was it the movie or the film goes, the old perfect 10? Um, I think I think he was, he's a 10 out of 10. And, and I think Aaron, yeah. just, Aaron just seems to keep getting better, better, better and better. And I don't think he's far off 10 out of 10 in his position either. Midfield is the, uh, the selection point this week for the public to vote on. Uh, where would you guys go with your all-time All Blacks midfield? Oh, I think it's I think it's hard to go past my Nonu and Comrade Smith. I think those would probably be probably be the two that I'd go with. I think if you're looking through combinations and how many test matches they played together and the success that they had, 
Um, it'd be pretty hard to go um, past those two. And I think, you know, it took them a while. It took them a while as well. When you think about it, um, you know, two guys that you know didn't come in, um, you know, didn't come in and weren't authorities. Sorry, not authorities. Um, weren't set in stone from from the get go. They had to work on it, and then um, you know, the rest is history. I think their combination uh, was definitely the best in, in New Zealand history. And you could arguably say, possibly in world rugby as well. But you know, those would probably be the two that I would go with. Um, that would probably have the best combination. Yeah, look, for me, you, you've got to acknowledge Walter and, and Frank. Um, I, I think they were exceptional um, in, in their day. The, the, you know, the ability to break defences down, but also defend really well. Um, they were exceptional and they certainly enjoyed themselves when, when playing. That's what I always loved watching those. <laughs> they always did it with a smile on their face, which was, um, which was awesome to see. But I, I don't think you can go past Ma'a and Conrad. I, I just think... Um, you, you talk about, you know, I was just talking about um, DC and, and Nuggie around how they're complete players. Well, um, wh where they got to in the end was just unbelievable. Um, you know, it was a triple threat game. Conrad's ability to release the outside, his ability also defensively to, to, to make opposition teams do what he wanted them to do um, was massive. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I, th I think it'll be a no-brainer that we'll see 12 and 13 with, with Nono and Smith. Yeah, tune in next week to the breakdown on Monday and you'll find out who won there in the midfield. Um, people like Bruce Robertson, obviously, for the old school people who get a mention, but, geez, Conrad and Ma, they're the iconic midfield of the modern era. So, yeah, I think you guys are right on the money there. And, of course, Walter Little and Frank Bunch managed to get some harbour in there just to finish the show. <laughs> had to, mate. Had to. Can't, can't forget those two legends, mate. <laughs> How, how good were they to watch play, though? It didn't matter if it was at the All Blacks level, Harbour level, club level. They did everything with a smile on their face, and, and they were so yeah. good at executing in the big moment. Um, I, do, I just loved it as a kid watching those guys um, go about their business. And you think of the level of midfielder that they held out of the team, people like Alama Uramia, Lee Stensonis, um, Ronnie Clark. There were some really good midfielders that those guys kept out. Oh, massively. Well, that's certain, I think. And I think um, if, for the fact that you know they, they came together as well, and uh, we're obviously we talk around for Jipper and I um, at the start at the start of our club of North Harbour, and being able to you know, bring that bring that to where where it is now, and have the opportunity to play for North Harbour it starts with players like that 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 gave so much, and um, probably the biggest thing as well. They had a lot of good stories of, of them being able to off the field as well. They enjoyed themselves off the field, which is always which is always great in those times. So um, look, I think Jipper Porter on a really good point. They had a lot of fun, and whenever we get them to come back in we're lucky enough to get them in um they come in and, and talk to us they talk around that fun aspect and being able to enjoy enjoy yourself with your mates because yeah, you're not here for a long time and um it's been able to have those friendships that that you do have and um you know those two were awesome for our club and um you know probably uh, they were great all blacks together as well awesome guys so that's another aotearoa rugby pod all wrapped up thank you very much to james parsons to Bryn hall and uh thank you for me ross carl everyone in new zealand please stay safe um, enjoy yourselves during your lockdown and hopefully we'll have some footy back for you sometime soon. We'll catch you next week.